most VCs, even some of the top VCs right now are getting liquidated. I agree with you, the model is broken, but cover, but from taking profits versus trading, I know in some, it, it overlaps at times, but other times it's just, again, you're just taking profits. Yeah. I don't sit there watching charts or, or, or trying to time every investment I make. But at the same time, when I see everything pumping and things being overly bullish, taking profits from projects we invest in, I don't yeah. see that as, uh, as trading. Yeah. Everything you're doing there is why why they created security laws in order to prevent people getting on the wrong side of those trades. That I agree with. 100% agree with that point. And right. I also agree with the models broken. I also agree that, and I think a lot of people that would come in on those trades, I want to also make a disclaimer. A lot of those projects pumped even further during the bull market, like Blocktopia, for example. We put in, uh, let's say we put in 50K. I can't remember what the number was, or 60 or, or 100, I think it was 100K. We put in 100K in Blocktopia. We sold when it launched at 100K. Within weeks, that 100K became worth uh, eventually um, multiple eight figures. So it's one of the top projects we invested in. So we lost a lot of uh, upside potential as well, which kind of goes, you know, supports the point that trading doesn't work. But at the same time, we covered our risk wherever possible when the markets were too hyped up. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, Anthony it's, it's, game, it's, a, it's a short-term arbitrage, but it, it's a regulatory arbitrage, definitely. Yeah, and it's. I want to also in, in, again. In I, I want to confuse conf laws. They would, when that happens, they call it a scam, and it does happen pre-IPO to IPO. Um, but those are the types of things where um, investment banks get a lot of shit when it happens. And I also want to stress. I want to kind of support the point you made. The model was severely broken. No lockup period. So eventually lockup periods started coming up. The model was severely broken and lockup periods are necessary because at the end of the day, it's the retail market um, that eventually gets fucked. So I want to support your point there, but also find it irresponsible if we don't sell when the market is just too frothy because otherwise what's the point? Yeah, it's a, di it's a on... dilemma from an opportunity. And, and um, th this is where when, you, when you're doing that, you have to become a trader. You're driven to trading. That's a good point. Because that's exactly the point. I'm like, exactly. Like when we don't sell and then we see every other VC selling and that's the dilemma you're in unless you're sitting on, on fucking that's a billion problem. dollars. That's the problem with liquidity on startups. Um, it, 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 you've got to create the value whereas you can trade without creating the value which leads to scammy behavior. And then you miss out on things like Blocktop. But even Blocktop, you don't miss out because you've got a distribution of 5%. You're still holding 95% of your tokens. And then when the bear market hits and liquidity dries up, there, where we sell distributions, we impact the token price heavily, and we're in a bear market. So, what's the point of selling? So, in yeah. that market, that's a different story. Yeah, and then you get the exchanges playing the game, and then you get the market makers playing the game, and and this is the shit that just that ends up with regulators jumping in. Exactly. Now, what we do just to kind of uh, point, you know, just be uh, completely open. Our strategy is very clear and open. We tell the project, hey, when we get the distribution, we're going to sell because the market is too hyped up. And the project generally agrees and they know that's a strategy, which is even weirder. I'm like, it's like the project and the VCs are working together. And then I'm like, who, who, who's, who's on the other end? Now, people on the other end made money because they were flipping it as well. So it was all like just pure well, speculation bought. during the bull market. Yeah, someone bought. Eventually, exactly. Eventually, the last one holding the ball is the one that lost. And yeah, you just never you know. know. I, I get it. But you, your, your analogy is they were probably DGENs uh, anyway. Um, no, look, I don't, I don't want to take it away. Maybe some of them bought and held. So I, I don't want to take it away and, and just, plump, you know. Yeah, but they got I think... the shit price. They, they, they invested in an early project and got the, the shit price. And now they've got to shit, sit there for years hoping that this project turns around. Exactly. And then to make it even worse, the VCs investing early, even us, like to, to get into that space, you had to be early in crypto. You have to have connections, a reputation, same as the NFT space, which even though I'm part of those networks and those tribes, getting those early projects, getting that deal flow and getting access to the projects because we help them with you know, marketing and all that. So projects want to work with us. Even though I'm part of that circle and you know we've made money being part of that circle, it's, it's just... It's the ugly side of crypto. It's just not right. And we see you... Yeah, there's something internally, right? This is how I felt when I worked in, um, in the investment bank and market making. There was something in your body internal that didn't quite feel right. Yeah? It, I mean, it was cool. You're making money. But there's something that just you, could, you maybe can't articulate it. But something feels a bit wrong, right? I wouldn't say it feels wrong because I never participated in pumping projects. So the people that were pumping the projects or promoting them, 
I think if I was doing that or we were doing that, I'd feel very wrong. But at the same time, feeling wrong in the sense that the, I'm part of a broken system. Yeah. It's interesting. And, and here's the key to being a great trader and a great investor. Don't, don't be ethical. Um, don't, don't have that kind of emotional tie. And that's the challenge. I would say, here, I right? if, you, if you cross, if you cross I, would, I would counter this. If you cross the ethics line, the influences that crossed the ethics line in 2018 don't exist today. The influences that we're pumping projects right now, they're pumping them and selling them to their audience. There's a reason I never pump a project. Obviously, ethics is one, but it doesn't make business sense either. I'm throwing away my reputation. So I'd say being unethical if you're anonymous, but if you've got a following and no one knows you're being unethical, then you're lucky. Um, I don't even know how to be anonymous. Um, but if you're a public figure, you've got like the, the ROI on building a reputation in crypto is in, insane. You know, Richard's built... A massive following in the last few years, and I'm 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 sure he's seen the return with the community he's built versus before he built that reputation. So building a reputation in crypto, there's multiples in ROI versus um, <laughs> real life. Um, but at the same time, you know, destroying it is very easy because reputation is all you got. Um, Burden and Anthony, all you guys, you have have your hand up. Go ahead, guys. Yeah, I just want to chime in, kind of from the the project owner side of things as well. Um, and from my experience, some of the best conversations I've had in my life have been with VCs and some of the worst have been with VCs. There are good characters and bad characters, right? And there are precautions as a project owner that you can take, like such as vesting schedules and so many more, just as any other startup business, to protect yourself and your business and your project and your community and your investors beyond the VCs you're talking to. Um, so if you're making the right choices, then you're enabling yourself for that success. And, and I think it all comes down to education again. It's really about education and this being such a new space, there's that lack of education. And that's where that opportunity for the system to be exploited as a potentially broken system comes into play. But realistically, if you're educated and you're doing the right things, you're securing yourself and saving yourself. And without VCs, we're in trouble as some of these uh, indie startups. Yeah. So, so I want to I mention, add one more thing there. I think it's something that could be music to your ears. If you do the wrong thing as a VC, so if you sell when you say you're not selling or if you dump and hurt liquidity or if you dump during bear markets. Um, so and when you do it in a way that harms the project or you hype up a project or you publicly support it and then you dump it, um, that, again – that destroys your reputation. You stop getting deal flow. So there's a lot of VCs that didn't give a fuck, and I'm, I'm not naming anybody, and they don't get the same deal are these, flow they are did these before. Like, um, actual, when you say VCs, are these like actual regulated VCs, or are these just whales that have like... No, no, I'm, talk, I'm talking about... Re most of them are regulated VCs. You know, whales that have it as a side job generally uh, are shunned upon in the space, and they don't get allocations. So allocations are very limited. So it's a very small circle of investors that get it. Um, and then you, you get the likes of Anamoka and Reese and Outlier. These guys wouldn't send deal flow to people that do the wrong thing. So mm -hmm. kind of self-regulation is, is working better than I expected. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you've got even those regulated VCs, they've got, you know, they've got investors and they have to do the right thing. So it's always a balance. We want to maintain the, our reputation. What's the, un, what's the unwritten contract in terms of when they can sell? Um, it, it depends what you agree on with the project. So outside the vesting schedule, there's like, you know, a, 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 a gentleman's agreement. Now you can easily break it, but then the project will just tell other VCs and VCs will put you on a blacklist. So no, there's, no, there's... No one cares, Mario. They break it. In a bear market, everyone's breaking the, and it. That's what happens. That so that, that, this right now, so. But yeah, exactly. I don't want to... What I want to say, Wahid, is it's, it's fascinating because... The people that were on the golden list, they're like the VCs everyone respects. They're like when a bear market hits, all rules are off. And suddenly you got all the biggest guys no longer giving a fuck. And three arrows capital was in the top tier. We had a guy, our CIO gave me a top tier list of top VCs, like 10 or 15 of them. Three arrows capital was in the top, top of that list. Okay. And well, he do remember those days. Everyone's like, get into outlier, get into three arrows. And look what happened to them now. So obviously they didn't do it based on ethics. They did it out of necessity. But then a lot of VCs during the bear market, they built a reputation. Again, I don't want to mention their name. I wish I could, but I won't. Um, they built a massive reputation to never dump. And Wahid, you know who I'm talking about. Would it, and both, wouldn't it be you know, cool? Hey, wouldn't it be cool if someone invented something that made it so you couldn't dump and you had to live by your word? You could call it the truth engine, you know? And it would penalize you if you dumped early. But then if you didn't dump early, you got rewarded by the other people's penalties. That would be like so cool. You could Just call it hex. We have vesting contracts. For that. We <laughs> code smart contracts. We, we, we code out smart contracts that release on particular schedules. And I guess there would just be a few more lines of code to add the rewards to be redistributed to other people. Yeah. yeah. that's If you're in programmable money to change finance, 
program the fucking money. I'm in this to remove human counterparty risk, not to add to it. Did you? So with Hex, did you do a private round? I don't know. You didn't. You just did an airdrop to no, Bitcoin. No, it launched. It launched totally complete and sufficiently decentralized at launch. So this is this is why this is why you didn't face that issue. So what happens with projects is that instead of airdropping, they need the money. I don't think you needed the money. So because they needed the money, they did that private round with VCs, and they during the bull market, everyone was giving unlocking schedules. At least shitty projects, good projects, they gave very limited unlocks or no unlocks. So our best investments are locked for at least a year. Um, so when you do, but I mean, like algorithmically, to... even crappy can't do anything with it. Bitcoin has algorithmic locking, like check time lock verify exists, or rather check lock time verify. It's a feature, you know. Has anyone else yeah. on the panel invested privately in projects? I'm actually curious. Any other? Uh, I, we didn't invite any VCs today, but anyone invested privately in any projects? You did some. You did a lot of those, but you did it with yeah. long, you know, equities. All our equity investments are locked. Yeah, well, tier we, one projects we, we are uh, most of them are locked. Yeah, we we had an interesting experience because we built. So obviously, we built the first securities business in Bitcoin. Um, and then um, in 2017, we got disrupted because all of our clients um, stopped selling equity and started doing ICOs. Um, and so we had to build a process by force uh, because we had no clients left um, for how to um, sell a, uh, allow people to sell their tokens in compliance with securities law. Um, but we got completely disrupted. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've, I've invested... You know, my, my best ICO was obviously Ethereum um, and, uh, yeah, did loads, loads in between. But um, the, 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 again, yeah, it's, it's just I'm at that long-term stage because I just don't. These games drive you, again, bringing it back to the topic, these games drive you to being a trader where you have no choice but to be a trader. Um, and then you're going to have to learn the skills of trading in these games or it's just going to be, you know, a short term thing. But eventually, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very, Simon, it's a very short term thing. That period, the period I'm referring to was like a four month period last year where 90% yeah. of projects were doing 10x or more. There was a big debate within the company. Like, should we hold? Should we sell? We decided yeah. to sell because it's a logical thing to do. But generally, that's not the case. Next bull yeah. run, will that happen again? We don't know. NFTs though. Fuck, NFTs are insane. There's no lockups in NFTs. Everyone getting whitelisted was selling at, at 10, 20, 30, 40 X's and everyone that, that buys in early. The NFT space was ugly. So I'm waiting for regulators to come in there. Um, I, had a, I had a question for Richard. Can, with, your, with your whole hex thing, can you, uh, can you hold NFTs for a prolonged amount of time or is it just uh, other things? Nope. The only thing that you can lock in hex is hex itself. It helps uh, Hex go up. We don't want to dilute our primary feature to help pump other things that aren't the thing we care about, you know? All right. Well, I'm, pu I'm putting a patent on that idea, so I'm not taking it. I think, I think prior art would uh, make it not possible, but you could try. You can't patent things that are, have prior art. Like, even if no one ever registered the thing, it's once it's in the public, you, you can't patent it. You say that now, but once the tables have turned, Richard. <laughs> respect, bro. Respect. Anthony, Bolivian, anything to add, guys, before we get into the coin fashion segment? Yeah, I think I'm going to jump off now. But yeah, I think um, liquidity creates this really interesting issue. So traditionally, the markets have worked on um, that if you get in early, you have to be in it for the long term. And um, crypto really disrupted that model and liquidity is both a gift and a real a real problem for i'll actually i'll actually i think you like this simon before you jump off wahid what's your experience you, you're an equities guy uh you, you know you, you run a hedge fund you've been in that space for a long time and then you launch a token project and seen crypto during a bull market and crypto during a bear market <laughs> enlighten us Wahid, you there? Um, I'm in a little bit of a loud place. I'll try my best. Um, no, the mic is good. Sorry, yeah, but I'm in a little bit of a loud place. But anyways, um, look, um, I, um, I'm, I'm going to, um, I, you know, I'm a long-term investor. I'm in private equity. Uh, obviously, a Web3 project is 
is a little bit more liquid than what I'm usually used to. And uh, you and I uh, met in, in, my, in our whole pre-IDO um, time, and you and others told me that if you don't get these VCs, and I'm not going to mention them, you don't get retail. You don't have a good IDO. And for me, it wasn't about a pump. It was, uh, Mario, let's be very uh, honest with one another. You were like, Wahid, you're all about long-term value creation, etc. I respect that. But if you don't pump, you're going to be considered a loser for the rest of your life. And I'm like, holy shit, that's a big hurdle. And then you told me, Wahid, if you don't do a 10x, you're a real loser. And, um, and, and, you, and you and I are very close friends, Mario, but I was under a lot of pressure to make sure that I was not a loser, even though nothing about the idea was really about long-term value creation. So we, we loaded up, you know, all these VCs and, uh, you know, no one really wanted to care about long-term value creation. They were all about what's your circulating uh, market cap at TGE, where's the squeeze? And, you know, we went down this rabbit hole of pure zero value creation and all the value we created in our, in our fashion company, our open source fashion ecosystem for 22 years. I was like, my gosh, it's too late to cancel and we have to go down this thing. And then even we launched on the day of the Ukrainian invasion and everyone called me saying cancel, delay, delay, cancel. And I said, fuck it. We just spent all this money to do this. It was a complete waste of time, a complete loss of energy, frankly. So we're just going to complete it. And then lo and behold, my hunch was correct. All these great VCs turned out not to be great. They ended up, you know, absolutely dumping. We are still at IDO or slightly above IDO. And now I, I, I'm told by the VCs that's a miracle. And since we're still 2x from our seed round, you know, we reserve the right to keep selling. So you just can't win. So I, for all the speakers that said this is a shit process, I agree. I hate it. I wish I never did it. But now we have a live token. We have a great project and we'll just live with it. And, and to add to the point you've made, Wahid, is that these VCs that sold Wahid's coin, just to yeah, end it with this. You told me they were the creme de la creme, the best of the best. It, they and they were. Shit. Okay. Yeah. So, so the thing is, during the bull market, just you want to unmute, man? Unmute because I can hear myself double. Yeah. So, so just to echo what, what, oh yeah, Wahid, can you mute? Testing, testing. Good. So, so to, to, to kind of echo and, and support what Wahid is saying is that, the, 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 the VCs that sold, at least, actually, Wahid, I have a question for you. I want to end it with this. The VCs selling now, were they the ones that, were some of them sellers in the bull market or generally, is actually, is, are any of them holding? Like, is there many holding or any of them holding or not really? You got to unmute and speak. Sorry, just because I'm in the last place, I'm very careful. Look, um... I can, I can tell you the majority are selling because even if we outperform, the fact that we outperform and someone else is down 95%, their way of running risk is to just sell the winners. And, you know, um, and, and, and that's insane, but that's yeah, crazy. Because like, they're so, because they're not, it's a bear guys. market. They're not all these it's guys. They're stupid, not Richard. Though. They're not Simon. They're not all these guys that have been there for 10 years. Okay. The, the whole space is a bunch of kids okay and so i don't know what to tell you but no i think the majority are sellers and there there are some funds that got extra tokens because quote unquote they give you advice and and they um you know they're, they're there for the long-term success of the project it was all bullshit. but anyone who actually signed a contract to that effect those guys i'm absolutely crucifying i'm yanking yeah, just all to... their bonus tokens of course yeah, because they didn't deliver on their end. But just to, to kind of conclude, uh, some of these VCs that Wahid is talking about, again, I'm not talking about shitty VCs that just came up. We're talking about people that have joint funds with Anamoka. We're talking about people like Three Hours Capital. Uh, Outlier Ventures almost came in, but um, Outlier Ventures don't sell. Um, so, uh, the, the, Jamie's been on the show for a few times. Um, but yeah, Anthony, any final words, man, before we go to the uh, coin fashions, a few confessions, and then the... And Simon, I know you got to jump off. You can jump off anytime, bro. Thanks a lot, as always, for coming on today and tuesday all right no worries um you know that's absolutely fascinating a few things i'll say in closing i'm um, like mario i love the transparency of um how you just bring these um issues to the front and just discuss them out in the open when they're kind of ha hiding in the shadows um and the other thing is that the fact that you know that your uh vc sold because you have all the blockchain addresses and you can call out bad behavior and stuff is a pretty cool part of it um, but yeah, liquidity causes issues. And here's what I'm saying: if you guys, were, if anyone wants to trade, trade. It's your, it's your choice. It's a free, it's a, it's a free choice. 
But at some stage, you have to get to long term investing value creation. You have to figure out what your base is and you have to come up with an investment, an investment thesis to pull your trades out and put them into investments. So that could be creating a business or it could be investing. Yeah, I got I got I want to just say like what you just said now is probably the most important part of the show and I think Richard you said the same thing earlier is that business and if you look at my slogan on on my website Twitter etc is do good do it consistently be patient. So be patient is what Simon just said is about investing and holding and waiting. Do good do it consistently. That's not be me being a very nice person. That's just business sense. So to make money unless you're a scammer and that's not sustainable um to make money in business you got to create value. And whenever you see a, a you know, the, the play to earn model early on wasn't creating any value and it wasn't sustainable. Everyone called it a pyramid scheme type model until it started creating value, such as players enjoying the game or socializing, etc. So with any organization you build, any project you launch, if you don't um, create value, no one will pay you because they're not getting any value out of it. And that's not just in crypto. So that's why Richard and Simon made the point is that you got to create value. And then the other point is that most of the billionaires in the crypto space or people sitting on, on hundreds of millions of dollars, most of them are people that just held very little. None of the top 10 wealthiest or top 20 or top 100 wealthiest people in the world, as far as I know, none of them are traders. So I'm not you know, shitting on trading because it works on the markets that are inefficient. Sam Bankman Freed made his money through arbitrage, not trading, but still, because um, the markets were inefficient back then. A lot of guys in the NFT space made life-changing money, seven, eight figures, generally you know, six or seven, uh, out of nothing because uh, you know they just traded during the bull run. Um, so I, I'm, in crypto, it works, especially in your asset classes. But as soon as the market, you know, you can't trade Bitcoin. I had the guy, we hired a guy to do, to lead our trading desk that we started a month ago. So we're doing the experiment. And then two days ago, he sends a message in the group, so he has a thesis. He has a certain pattern he sees with certain you know, altcoins that's working well for him. So we're testing it ourselves. We'll update in the space how that's going. It'll be an interesting experiment, even if we lose, I don't care. Um, but he said something two days ago. He's like, Mario, buy Bitcoin. I lost my shit. Uh, like, I, I really got upset. I'm like, man, you saw an inefficient market, which is altcoins on a certain exchange. And you saw a model that's repeatable because it's been working for you. Suddenly now, and that's what happens with traders. Suddenly now you believe... You're smarter than everyone else. You're smarter than institutions that spend millions of dollars, hire the smartest minds. They've got uh, algorithmic trading to try to make money. And that's what leads to efficient markets. And you and your brain and your eight hours a day or 10 hours a day, and that has never traded in his life until a few months ago, are going to outsmart them. You can't trade Bitcoin. It's an efficient market. People are ahead of you. But you can trade, in my opinion, you can trade inefficient assets but it will just suck up your time. I'll, I will never trade. My time is too valuable for that. But hiring people to trade, I'm testing. Um, so it kind of be my conclusion. Simon, do you agree? Uh, cool, yeah. I mean, um, yes, yeah, just uh, hiring people to trade. I haven't done that one. But, um, yeah, it's a long-term value. I think there's some, some gold dust there. Um, I'll do a final shill if I can just before I leave. Yeah, you never um, shill, man. Please do. Yeah, if you um, want a free video series on um, exactly how to put together the investing part, not the trading part, uh, then head over to retirementplanb.com. Uh, that was yeah, if you can, Simon, you've been, you've been on the show a few times. So, so Romy will DM you just to get the link to it, and I'll do a tweet about it a few times because um, you've been on, on like 50 to 60% of our shows. So um, would love to tweet about it as well. And it's not a trading, it's not a trading uh, cor or course or, any, or video. So I, I, I've never promoted any trading videos because I just think it's too risky. But investing, uh, more than happy to tweet about it. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Um, See you. Thanks a lot, Simon. Richard, any final words before we get to the confession yes, segment? Yes, sir. Yes. Everyone, please enjoy your free airdrop on PulseChain.com. Remember, this Ethereum merge was awesome, but it's not going to make fees lower. And it's not going to give us higher throughput. It's not going to have quicker transactions. So it's going to burn less electricity. It's going to help the price go up because it's going to inflate less. But for the more supply and the world's largest free airdrop, copy of all your coins on a new chain, that's PulseChain.com. Hex.com. Is that, is that what's, the, what's the what, – what, is it a proof-of-stake blockchain? For, for Oh, no, it's an ERC yep. token, isn't it, for Pulse? No. Pulse is a full copy of the Ethereum oh, network. Oh, yes, yes. I remember. Everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. State and yeah, everything. And it's yep. A, Proof of stake. Yes. And also, uh, Hex.com dipped real good. It's had a 1,000 days of perfect, flawless operation. Price went up a million percent. 
dip 95%. Uh, it's up off of the 95% dip now, I believe. And uh, see, I was going to cross the street. No, nope, they're going to let me go. Um, also, we got PulseX.com. It's a fork Uniswap, does fee burning and stuff, whereas like the Uniswap token has no relationship to the exchange itself. Ours really does. So, and all of these tokens, like Pulse Chain only deflates, there's no inflation. PulseX only deflates, there's no inflation. Pulse.com, or rather, Hex.com has an inflation rate of a maximum 3.69%. The average stake length is actually seven years. So, it's miraculous. Like, for normal retail investors to delay gratification on average seven years, that means you got to have a lot of 15 year stakes to cancel out a lot of one year stakes. I mean, that's rather Nobel Prize worthy to get people to delay gratification that much. And between you and me, the only thing any price chart in the whole world cares about is buying and holding. And everything else is a meme and a story and a narrative as to why you should buy and hold. So Bitcoin used to be peer-to-peer digital cash. It gave up on it. Then it was going to be programmable money. Gave up on it. Then it's digital gold. Maybe that one will last. But it went up, you know, 69,000 X. 690 million percent. Uh, Richard, um, I, I, have a, I want to ask you a quick question before we, we move on yeah. to the next segment. It's one well, I'm curious just, about. Just saying, we monetize the only thing that Price Chart cares about, which is buying and holding. Everything else is bullshit. You hear about people like, you know, we're going to green out the dump. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. Oh, we're going we're to buy for the merge. We're going to buy for this, that. It's all bullshit. Why not just give the inflation to the people that have the longest time horizons? And what do you think happens with, when you have something that people lock up for 15 years when they buy it? I mean, that's the most real commitment that you can possibly uh, ever make. But go ahead. Uh, yeah, Richard, question I have, and that's a selfish question. So I remember the early days in crypto when you were just in your studio, and I know you made a, a, a lot of money being early in Bitcoin and, and pre-Bitcoin as well. Um, and I remember you were just pretty, I think from memory, you were pretty humble sitting in your studio. Uh, you, didn't, you didn't have all that flash that you have now. And then you started buying, I, I, I didn't follow you for a while. Um, and then I saw you with the Lambo, with the Rolls Royce, with all the clothes. And I think you mentioned, I'm going to, you know, people like it. I'm doing it to get attention. You know, I know Ty Lopez, a lot of people hate him. He's like, Mario, I just get, you know, it works. Um, if the end value of what I'm providing is good, well, I'm, what am I doing? I'm just trying to get attention through all that branding. Now, obviously you get a lot of hate from all the flashiness as well, among other things. My question is, does it work when you're building a personal brand? Like I'm doing a lot of videos and stuff. My team started telling me buy branded clothes. Now I can never get even close to your level of flashiness, but how well does it work? It grabs attention. The, the attention you get versus the hate is the attention. The so, ROI outweighs the hate. I mean, if you're on the internet, you're going to get hate. Vitalik. I mean, Hex went up 10,000 X. It's built on Ethereum. So thanks Ethereum. Right, Hexagon's got tons of free airdrops because of Ethereum. Thanks, Ethereum. Everybody that has a bog standard ERC20 never got a 51% attack like every other altcoin got. Thanks, Ethereum. And everyone still hates Vitalik. And he writes free open source software. He funds uh, anti-aging medicine. He funds uh, anti uh, other like health things. Like the guys out there writing free open source software. Now, yes, he did make the top and sell the top on the day. Yes, he has done that more than one cycle. Like, he's not all golden. But, you know, he's not flashy. And yet, people still hate him. Because if people know you exist, they're going to hate you. And so the difference is, can you get the other side? If you're going to get hated anyway, can you get people to like you too? And so, you know, human beings have this thing built into them where they care about proof of work. How do I know a girl has enough fat resources to supply the kid with nutrients after we have a baby? Big old titties. Extra resources what? serve no extra purpose at all. Huh? It's signaling. So you can go on Wikipedia and search up social sexual signaling theory. And how do you know that a bird has enough resources to take care of your uh, little baby bird? Well, look, it built this cool nest and it's got all these extra stupid feathers that provide no other utility. And so I just bought today a $10,000 Louis Vuitton kite. I don't even fly kites, bro. But now I got a $10,000 Louis Vuitton kite that I'm going to go make fun of people with. I got see through bags. I got the stupidest things. I got ping pong paddles, Louis Vuitton ping pong paddles. I spent like $150,000 over the last couple of days on fashion stuff. Just a flex. People haven't seen it yet. Now, why am I doing that? Because no one cares that 
that I if I raised twenty seven million for charity. Nobody cares. Nobody cares that I cur- a cryptocurrency that went up in price a million percent in two years with flawless, perfect operation. No one cares. They care more that I own the world's largest diamond. They care more that I'd waste ten thousand dollars on a stupid kite. Now, do I wish I lived in a better world where we had a real meritocracy and if you did better things, you got more viewers, more likes, and more power and more influence in the world? I wish I lived in that world. You know, I've written free self-help books. If you followed the advice in them, you'd land where I'm landed right now. Constant orgasm. But people don't read the books, and they're free. And they've been out for years before I ever said a thing about Bitcoin. So, you know, I live in a world where you can either cry like a bitch about how the game's set up, or you could go win the game. I chose to win the game, and my people chose to win the game. And by and large, we're winning. So, you know, if you say you're rich, show me your Lambo. You say you're rich, show me a $10,000 kite. It's proof of work. It's hard to fake that crap. It's very hard to fake a car. Easy to fake some of the Louis crap, but very hard to fake a car. And so when people see that you got, look, man, if I see you got a cool-ass car, I am going to walk over to you and say hi because I want to meet you because I think that's cool. If you're wearing a cool-ass outfit, I'm going to walk over to you and say hi and be like, hey, man, why you got that cool-ass outfit? What do you do? Tell me about you. And, and I'm, you know, I'm at the top of the game. And I will do that. I'm going to come up and approach you if you got a cool car. you got security with them. I'm like, hey, what's up? What is security, bro? What's up? What's your thing? Is there synergy here somewhere? And so, like, it's it's a way to shortcut the human being's search Yo, for I truthful gotta, statements I, by proof of work. I, I, I got I to tell you this, and I'll give the mic to Bolivian. Then, obviously, Charlie's been too patient. But I want to I make fun of myself for a second. So I used to wear shorts and T-shirts and slippers. For most of my life, my, I never branded clothes. You know, people that know me, including Romy next to me and KK, they, I look I looked like a homeless person, even though I was successful well before crypto and e So I'm pretty comfortable in life. Now, I started wearing branded clothes after um, a, a gentleman called Gorive, who runs the biggest incubator in crypto, one of the biggest. He's like, Mario, even wear like subtly branded clothes. I only wear black. I've only worn black for years. Subtly branded clothes, it makes a difference. And then I found out a few months ago about watches and the entire industry of watches. So I got an AP, could get another one. And it's true. Now when I wear a watch to a meeting, they look at it, even though I hate fucking watches. watches. Branded clothes, people say, oh, nice hat, nice Dior sh- or Louboutin shoes or Dior t-shirt, whatever. So it works. But I'm still very subtle about it. Tomorrow, so I'm a bachata dancer as well. I travel the world. I'm in Greece today dancing bachata, um, which, you know, as an artist. As an artist, you have to be flashy. So <laughs> people are going to hate on me potentially now because I'm going to try for the first time to be really flashy. So I've got like a, 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 the, the square two, I think it's called, I can't remember, D square two, jeans full of crystals, all of it, it's black again, a, a crystallized Versace t-shirt, and a jacket, Balmain jacket, heavy as fuck, full of crystals, and then my shoes, my Giuseppe shoes, also all crystals, so I'm all going to be like a disco ball, and I usually have a videographer with me, filming me, so anyone on my Instagram, you can see that, filming me all the time, usually I just wear a suit, so I look sharp, it's a branded suit, but you can't see the brand, that's what I've always worn, first time ever tomorrow, I, I don't know if I'll check it out, I'm going to give it a shot, see how it goes, and if I get, so as an artist, when I go dance, girls line up to dance with you, because you're considered an artist, which is really good for my ego, and plus it's fun, so I want to see if it's going to work now when I wear crystal shit. Will people avoid me more because I'm way too flashy? Will I get other artists you know, talking shit about me? Or will I have a bigger line of girls lining up to dance with me as an artist? So the experiment it's, it's will be, be tomorrow. Totally, I can already answer these questions for you. It's totally a function of how comfortable the girls are with themselves. The girls that think that they're high value and are comfortable being looked at don't mind walking up to the most interesting guy in the place and meeting him. But the girls that are shy and don't have high opinions of themselves and are afraid that they'll be looked at because they're talking to the spicy guy in the room, they'll avoid you. And so it's really what kind of girl you want to attract. If you want to you know, attract a girl that sits at home and reads books and is wearing glasses and shit and sitting on the wall, that crystal shit will turn her off. But if you're talking to the girl that's you know, got her ass hanging out, the crystal is going to play hard. And traditionally, if you're actually being judged on your movements, it's a lot easier to see movement when we've got sequins that reflect light and when we can see the intersection of your limbs to your body, which is why ballet dancers wear tights. So the intersection of their limbs to their body is as tight as it can be. So it shows the most motion. So there's, you know, there's a, a strong tradition in the arts and in dance in particular to wear tight fitting sparkly clothing because it helps you see the movement better. So I think it's going to work out well for you. Okay, but I feel I feel like embarrassed even talking about this. Bolivian, 
<laughs> without hating on me, man, any final words? Welcome to the show. We don't usually talk about this at all. Uh, it's usually high-level conversations, but uh, I'm going to potentially make a douche out of myself tomorrow. But yeah, I'll, I'll give you the mic, bro, before I, I, Charlie goes on with uh, confessions. Sorry. Yeah. Um... Um, can I have... Oh, sorry. Yeah, of course. Um, Believe me. Go ahead and crypto. Go ahead. Yeah, I was still believing, sorry. So, yeah, I've been more of a listener <laughs> than a speaker because this is like an eye-opener for me. I'm not, I'm not I'm a glad. I'm not, Yeah? I'm glad, I'm glad. Well, welcome to the yeah, show. Please. Thank you. And uh, and Bolivian, any, anything to add? See, I, I never really say anything high value. I just wanted to ask Richard what color was the kite and the ping pong paddle. <laughs> Like, so I try. I really try to buy mostly monogram stuff because if I don't buy monogram, I'm relying on your knowledge of other manufacturers' catalogs to be able to identify what I'm wearing is expensive as hell. But if I wear something with a known monogram, like for instance, I just bought a Balenciaga black crystal jacket on denim. They unfortunately had a girl's bottom that was the same material, denim with black crystal, but I don't wear skirts and I wouldn't fit in it if I did. So, you know, I only have the top, right? But now, unless you're familiar with this year's Balenciaga catalog, you don't know whether I did that at home with my Bedazzler machine and bedazzled it or whether I paid $6,000 for it, which I did. In America, it'd probably be 9000 I paid 6000 euros. Well, actually, they're at parity now, but anyway, maybe it's like 7500 or 8500 US. Welcome, welcome to the so fashion I, table, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, my hold my on. kite is monogram, and my kite is brown Louis Vuitton monogram, and my ping pong paddles are brown Louis Vuitton monogram. The ping pong paddles were seventeen fifty, and the kite was seven thousand euros. That's ten thousand bucks. Yes. For a kite. For the kite, yeah, yes. It's ten thousand. Yeah, if you go, go ahead, I'll let LA finish. Yeah, I, if, it, if it was a good deal, I wouldn't buy it. It has to be a bad deal to serve my purpose. It has to. I have plane bag for fifty thousand. I got glow in the dark bags for thirty, forty thousand each. Like I just, I, I'm wasting money on purpose because the only utility it has is how expensive it is. It's probably not even a good kite. The kite probably sucks, but because it was expensive, now it has notoriety. You know, it's like most cars. Most cars get you from A to B, but the ones that's the most expensive is cooler. And for the record, my Bentley's way cooler than my Rolls. The Rolls I paid <laughs> seven hundred thousand. The Bentley's half my- it and murdered. Yeah, I can't hate on you. My my ugly profile picture costs a few hundred thousand as well. So so it's not it's not about the the quality. But okay, confessions, Charlie, man, you've been waiting patiently. Everyone loves your confession segment, so I'm really feeling guilty for delaying it. Um, everyone, coin fashions. Make sure you follow him. One of the best pla- best accounts I've seen on the platform. Plus, you gotta follow him to, to win the giveaways. We've announced 4K worth of winners Yo, on the can, Discord so far. Can you hear? Yeah. Can I hear what, man? KK? Anyone? Did I just cut out? No, no. I can hear you. No, you're here. I was... <laughs> okay, that was... I don't know where that came out of. Uh, Charlie, are you there, bro? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Um, thanks for having me back. Thanks for being here, man. One of the, 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 the fan favorite segments of every show. So uh, what, what type of confessions do you have for us today, man? Well, it feels like somewhat of a non sequitur given we were just talking about kites and fashion, but I have picked <laughs> some picked some trading uh, confessions with a little bit of an Ethereum theme, obviously, to uh, commemorate uh, the merge. So I will get sharing. So the first one is... Uh, I'll just read you the uh, the summary rather than the whole thing, but it says my wife has five ETH. She has never sold or traded at all, and she has outperformed me significantly. So this, I guess, kind of goes back to um, a bit what Richard was saying and what some of the other other guys were saying, which is trading as a as a skill set um, isn't for everybody. In fact, it's probably for very few people. You always see on um, brokers and things like that when you go to sign up it says 70 80 percent of people lose money um using our services um but they rely on you feeling that okay i'm one of i'm part of that 10 percent you know i'm part of that one percent whatever it might be uh and so this is just a very simple confession where someone essentially says you kind of 
two roads divide in a wood. His wife is obviously just sitting on this ETH and not even thinking about it. Um, whereas he's been actively trying to grow his stack and actually having the um, the opposite effect. It's that trying to time the market rather than time time in the market. So that was quite fun. Then uh, just shared another one. The only profitable trades I ever made were tracking wallets via Etherscan, and that seems to have inside uh, wallets that seem to have inside knowledge of exchange listings. So I think he's dropped off now. But that's Simon, a smart one. Yeah, that's Simon, a smart one. Simon was talking about. Uh, we, I mean, we were talking about VCs, um, but how you can track obviously the behavior and uh, buying and selling of certain individuals. And um, I think certainly I've noticed. Um, over the last year or so, uh, we've seen a real development of this sort of behavior. So we're talking, if we're talking about skills that traders um, have developed, obviously you've got your technicals, your fundamentals and all of this sort of stuff. Um, some guys in the crypto space look at on-chain analysis, they look at hash rate, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Um, but one of the things that you see a lot, um, certainly in terms of the NFT space um, and airdrops and things like that is, yeah, this kind of ether scan approach of, okay, flagging, uh, accounts, wallets that seem to have either prior information or just excellent judgment, um, and essentially riding on the coattails of whales. So it's just That's, interesting. It would, would you consider that insider? You can't consider that insider trading because you're just looking at public, at, a, at, a, at, a, at the blockchain, at public, publicly available information. So that's just. Yeah, I, I, mean, like I, I don't know about uh, insider trading uh, laws or anything like that, but it's publicly available. But I just think it's interesting that as the technology evolves, um, you know, new opportunities for leveraging data, leveraging certain systems, um, you know, will always appear and there will be people ready to, to take advantage of them. So I thought that was quite cool. Um, this is a, a bit of a touching one. I started with two ETH in August 21 and managed to stack up to 150 during the bull run. I sold most of it at 3K, but I struggle to feel that I deserve this money at 18 years old. So this is something similar to, you know, we've, we've touched on it a couple of times over the months, um, which is people not having confidence in in themselves or in their in their own achievements, uh, something I don't think Richard struggles with. Um, but that feeling of think you know good things are happening to me um, and are being automatically suspicious of them. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's something the sudden wealth syndrome, where essentially all of the uh, the targets, the goals, the structure in your life, whether it's going to school, or getting a you know your job schedule, all of that falls away when suddenly you might inherit or uh, kind of earn massive amounts of wealth, a lot of the structure that, you know, regulates most people's daily lives falls apart and suddenly they're at a bit of a loose end. Um, all of their friends are still working and stuff. So you're kind of just isolated and a bit a bit on your own. So um, I thought that was that was an interesting one. It kind of make, makes you think sometimes that, um, you know, the, the kind of the, the reward or the goal that a lot of people are aiming for doesn't doesn't necessarily uh, fulfill everybody. Obviously, some people people are built different. Um, some people enjoy it. But I want to add some, one thing, Charlie. Anybody that has that knows someone that does that on-chain analysis and follows wallets that <laughs> that, that, that that you know have a good success rate with their trades. Um, again, if you know how to do this or know someone that does, please hit me up. Uh, that's something I want to learn more about. Um, just I mean, I can I can chime in here, like like yeah, basically, one of the one of the coolest features about Hex is that it's primarily traded on chain, and I mean really, really, really primarily traded on chain, and so you can see when people's stakes end, whether they usually restake, whether they sell the interest, whether they dump everything, what other coins they hold, whether they got made money on those coins, and so if you go to Hex Vision. And see what whales are gonna, you know, have their coins coming out of uh, of lock, and then you can also, if you're starting, it's where you're gonna slot your end stake, and if you choose to put your end stake where there's not a lot of other people end staking, you might have less sell pressure on that day. You also see things like because people are able to sell their end stakes right after the day ticks over at midnight UTC time, that's when usually you'll get sells more 
often than not because that's the that day's stakes. And so there's a lot of really useful on-chain timing analysis and behavior analysis that exists in Hex that really doesn't exist a lot of other places. You know, if you try and if you, you can't do this in Bitcoin, you can't tell what any, any other coins they own because there are no other coins in Bitcoin. And it's very hard to do this with other coins that are traded primarily on exchange because you have iceberg orders, dark pools, and all this fake shill spoofing garbage. You know, there's a lot of noise, but when it's when everything's on Uniswap and on chain, there's the minimum amount of noise. It's it's clean, honest, wholesome, most transparent uh, trading in the world. I don't know of any anything in the world that's traded more transparently. Mario, I, I've got a really good tool to show that's not something I own. Somebody else, somebody else owns this one. It, it's called Bubble Maps. Um, it's an extraordinary piece of technology that allows you to track behavior of all tokens, NFTs, everything. Uh, and you can see a lot of the, the shady behaviors that go on across any chain, if I'm not mistaken, uh, or they're expanding across chains. I, I'm not a part of the team, but um, Bubble Maps is outstanding. I'll shoot you a DM with that. Yeah, please do. Thanks a lot, Anthony. I'm going to check it out. Richard could have the top 10 largest diamonds in the world and he'd still tell us to buy Hex. <laughs> um, Charlie, final one or two confessions? Yeah, sure. Um, I'd, I'd actually just quickly, a, a, a quick follow-up on that on that previous one when we were talking about tracking wallet um, addresses um, and you were talking about inside. tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of coins that so happened to be listed the next day on Coinbase and so therefore pumped massively. Uh, so he just sent a tweet about it and then law enforcement contacted him and he's been kind of dragged into this into this whole thing. But uh, Just yeah. because, hold on, just because he tweeted the wallet? Yeah, he basically just said, hey, I found this wallet. Isn't this interesting that they bought all this stuff? And then the next day uh, it... it um, kind of emerged that but is... they, they were being listed and no he's not in trouble he's basically been called he, like he's referenced oh. in the in the law suit like basically he oh, okay. brought it he brought it to light coinbase contacted him he gave them information law and basically law enforcement got involved and i i, I, I there's something going on about insider trading and all that sort of stuff I, I, yeah I, and another story we we covered it once there was uh, uh, the, the the first insider trading case i think it's the first case in crypto uh, for insider trading was an ex uh, Coinbase, I think it was an executive or someone there, um, and I think it's linked of, to this. Are you thinking of the Open Sea guy, the guy that was basically? Oh shit, shit, shit! Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I take it back. Yeah, yeah but no, was... there's also a story about Coinbase doing something that wasn't the first one, but the Coinbase is uh, taking some action. I think that they, they, yeah, they, they, they are. They've given um, evidence to authorities for someone they let go about insider trading. Again, we've covered that story. I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, anyway, there's insider trading, obviously, in every sector. It's not crypto specific. But um, I just thought it was interesting that, you know, that technology we were talking about in terms of wallet tracking and all that sort of stuff um, can, I guess, help uh, in that in that sense. Um, so one last one, uh, because I know I know you like the uh, the darker stuff. Um, I've just shared <laughs> it. So my dad, this is not um, Ethereum related, but my dad gave me 30k because I convinced him NFTs were the future and he wanted me to trade some for him. I gave him fair warning that nothing is promised. I YOLO'd into a drop and turned it into 75k within an hour. I told him things didn't work out and gave him 10k back and he was fine with it. <laughs> so... Yeah, so basically he just ripped his dad off and told him that he lost some money, but actually he made a load. How much That's did he make? Ridiculous. So he, he, his dad gave him 30 grand, he turned it into 75, and he paid his dad back 10, saying it didn't go well. So he profited Jesus. 65. I'm not good at maths, I'll, I'll take your word for that. <laughs> That's that is fucked ridiculous. up. Ridiculous. I personally would never take that in a million years. No, and obviously uh, most people wouldn't. Like, what's what's what price do you set your dignity and your relationship with your father? Uh, surely higher than sixty, maybe, maybe seventy. <laughs> That's insane, man. Um, 
Charlie, um, I was expecting a much darker one. This is just someone just being fucking dirty. Um, so but I, I, I'm glad. Uh, I, I don't want a darker. Da, yeah, don't I'm... do darkers. Don't, don't do. It. I want. I want. I, maybe darker ones are not the best for the audience. I'll, I'll get a vote, an audience to vote. Uh, but we do have um, the 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 pitch of the day by Viral Coin, which is the only pitch we have today uh, before we end the show. So Viral Coin's on stage. But I want to thank Charlie as always for coming on and sharing some confessions. Make sure you follow him. I've just tweeted about him with the, with the handle. Um, as part of the requirements to win the giveaways, you have to follow all the speakers, not just Charlie. Cool man. Thanks very much for having me. It's always a pleasure. Thanks a lot, Charlie. Uh, for the pitch of the day, we've got one pitch today because we're over time. Viral coin, you there, man? Ah, yes. Thanks, Mario. This is James McClendon, the founder of Viral Coin. Hey, shit! You just said your full name. I thought you guys were were, were didn't want to dox. No, we're fully doxed. Oh, sick! All right, cool. Because that was a concern the team had. They're like, Mario, these guys want to sponsor. We don't want to accept them because they're not doxing. Um, so I'm glad you've doxed and uh, uh, welcome to the roundtable. Uh, thanks, Mario. I believe... Okay. Go ahead, bro. So if people listening today agree that trading is challenging uh, in the industry, I think you might find interest in viral coin. Viral coin right. is revolutionary. I'll let, you, I'll let you, before you kick off the pitch, we'll, KK, do you want to give, give, give him the rules? Was it James? What was your name? Sorry, sir. Yes, yeah, James McClendon. Nice. Uh, so, minute and a half pitch time. I'm starting the timer right now. Mike is all yours. Go. Oh, wait, wait. Before you start, James, is it possible to go to a place with better audio? It might just be for me. But